The fundamental purpose animating the faith of God and his religion is to safeguard the interests and promote the unity of the human race. Baha'u'llah. When we observe the phenomena of the universe, we realize that the axis around which life revolves is love, while the axis around which death and destruction revolve is animosity and hatred. The proof is clear that in all degrees and kingdoms, unity and agreement, love and fellowship are the cause of life, whereas dissension, animosity, and separation are ever conducive to death. Therefore, we must strive with life and soul in order that day by day, unity and agreement may be increased among mankind and that love and affinity may become more resplendently glorious and manifest. Abdu'l-Baha. Thank you. So today, we're so happy to have Dr. Noura Mozun, and her topic is Conflict in Interpersonal and Romantic Relationships, a Baha'i Perspective. Psychotherapist Noura Mozun has been helping couples and individuals with their relationships for more than a decade. She holds a BS in Family Studies and Child Development and a PhD in Marriage and Family Therapy. She's also an instructor at Arizona State University and the co-creator of Can We Talk, a speaking platform where she and her co-speaker visit university campuses around the country, exploring the power of meaningful conversations and creating social change. So with that, I'll hand it off to Dr. Mozun. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. It's morning over here. How is everyone doing? Good to see you all. Good. I like to see it. Um, so yeah, I uh, my work is primarily with couples dealing with the love relationship. Um, so this little presentation, it's not very long at all. This little presentation that um, I'm going to be sharing with you guys uh, was designed for conflict between <clears throat> um, people who are in a relationship, uh, but it's actually extremely applicable to people who are in any kind of relationship, not just romantic. So uh, I will, I'm kind of sprinkling some Baha'i writings throughout, um, not that many like on the slides, but we'll incorporate Baha'i concepts as we go through it. So it'll be a mixture of uh, research and social science coupled with Baha'i writings, which um, is actually really beautiful because the Baha'i writings are very much aligned with, well, I should say it the other way around. Um, modern research is very much aligned with the Baha'i writings. So they actually go really hand in hand. So um, let's get started. And if you have, any questions that come up while I'm talking, please do share them. Uh, I It's a little unnerving just talking and, and having no idea if it's landing or making sense or if you have questions. So please feel free to share them. And then I think Paimana will, will, will share as she feels it's fitting. Yeah? Okay. Um, but you know, nodding in agreement, if you really like what I'm saying, is always really nice and encouraging. So feel free to nod away. <laughs> okay. So in order to talk about conflict, we're gonna have to understand the roots of conflict and uh, why we tend to have it frequently. Um, let me just, okay, perfect. I'm not touching anything now. Can you guys see the slide okay? Yeah, we can. All right. Okay, so the roots of conflict. Uh, every relationship essentially is um, trying to find the balance between two things that are quite contradictory, closeness and independence. Um, and this is really amplified in romantic relationships, but uh, it's it's the reality in, in most relationships, whether you think of like parent-child or sibling or friend or anything like that. So because we crave two things that are quite contradictory, um, we tend to experience conflict because striking that perfect balance is actually close to impossible, if not completely impossible. So the toggle between the two creates friction, which, which is the conflict. So conflict in, a, in an academic nutshell is the process of interaction that results when the behavior of one person interferes with the behavior of another. Um, however, one thing that I would really like to have us thinking about throughout this talk 
is that conflict is actually natural and not necessarily detrimental. It's the type of conflict that you have. It's how you handle the conflict that is um, critical. So that's what we're gonna be analyzing today. Um, would somebody actually be willing to read this quote? Sure, I can read it. <clears throat> he who expresses an opinion should not voice it as a correct and right, but set it forth as a contribution to the consensus of opinion, for the light of reality becomes apparent when two opinions coincide. A spark is produced when flint and steel come together. Abdul Baha. Thank you. So this, um, actually, I'm not sure if, who's gonna be watching this and who's gonna be familiar with the Baha'i writings, but just to give a little bit of context, um, Abdul Baha is one of the central figures of the Baha'i faith. And I, I actually should have referenced this in the beginning, so I apologize. Uh, Baha'u'llah is the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. And uh, when he passed in his will and testament, he left the charge of the faith in the hands of his eldest son, who's Abdul Baha. And so um, Abdul Baha was instrumental in helping understand, in, in keeping the Baha'i faith together, but also in, in helping kind of uh, create deeper understanding of the holy writings that Baha'is have. And so Baha'is do consider uh, his writings to be um, part of our scriptures. And, uh, and again, he's, he is one of our central figures. So all of the quotes that I'm using in today's fireside are from Abdul Baha, just for reference. So in this quote, um, the part that, that I think is really important for us to pay attention to that I think is what gets missed a lot in conversation is this idea of contributing to the consensus of opinion. That when we are sharing our thoughts, we're contributing it to the greater consensus rather than having it and, and contributing it to something that is um, part of discovering reality rather than total absolute truth. Uh, and I, I love this last sentence that says, a spark is produced when flint and steel come together. Um, so essentially, healthy conflict, constructive conflict happens when we approach it with the idea of finding truth together, rather than, you know, sometimes we pretend that that's what we're doing, or sometimes we're like, well, I'm just going to be really nice in how I present what is the truth, and, and people are going to come around and, and eventually get it. But this is actually really uh, encouraging a more humble approach of contributing to the greater pot of opinions, the, the consensus of opinions, um, which inherent in this is the idea of humility and an understanding that you don't know what you don't know. Okay, <clears throat> so before we can talk about positive conflict, we're going to talk about negative conflict and unhealthy conflict and, and the type of conflict that is considered um, poisonous in, in any kind of relationship. So negative conflict is any kind of destructive behavior that's bad for relationships, families, and even your physical health if you engage in too much negative conflict for too long. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if you engage in too much negative conflict for too long, uh, it can actually just chip away at the, um, the strength of a relationship, the strength of the family, and also even uh, an individual's physical health. Um, high amounts of conflict lead to stress and high levels of stress lead to all kinds of medical uh, issues and health issues. So there are essentially four major types of negative conflict. Um, and so we'll go through those a little bit. Um, the first kind is repressed anger. Uh, <clears throat> repressed anger is essentially the unconscious suppression of feelings of anger so that they end up coming out in other ways. Um, and there's two types of repressed anger. One is called gunny sacking. Gunny sacking is when you uh, 
you know, you kind of take note of every little thing that's upsetting you. You don't really let it go, um, but you're just quietly like mm -hmm, noted, noted. Oh, didn't like that either. Oh, and there's another way that you made me mad. And you just end up kind of collecting everything until you can't hang on to it anymore. And it just ends up spilling out. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have been in situations where uh, we realize that the person that we're talking to has had, has held on to their grievances for so long. And then in one moment, it, there's just this avalanche of, of pain, criticism, contempt, whatever, just coming out. And it can feel quite unfair. And it is, it's unfair to all parties involved. Um, and yeah. And so then another, a couple other types of repressed anger uh, come out in things like overeating, apathy, and just social emotional disconnect, depression, and displacement. Displacement is when we, um, well, displacement is, is often synonymous with scapegoating. So displacement is when we uh, misplace our anger about one thing onto something else. Um, and I want to say, you know, repressed anger tends to be something that I see a lot among people who are like very well intentioned and very much trying to keep the peace and trying to keep things smooth and simple. Um, but what ends up happening is the more we try to keep the peace, uh, the more resentment actually builds over time. And so this is one of the biggest poisons in a relationship again is, um, holding back what we really feel and what we really need because we just don't want to deal with conflict. Uh, and, and a lot of times I've seen a lot of people who think that that's uh, kind of taking one for the team and, and uh, constructive and, and with the ideal of unity, but I would lovingly suggest that that's not actually unity, it's, it's fear. Um, if, if we hold back how we really feel because we're afraid of of creating conflict it's not peace you're not actually keeping peace you're actually living in a state of fear um, and so the key is to really find a way to to constructively address it we're, we're we go from one extreme to the other we go from a space of just holding it in and grinning and bearing it to dumping and and uh you know getting angry and and having a hard time forgiving and really we haven't found the balance of being firm yet loving which is a very baha'i perspective of being frank and loving both of them go together in constructive conversation and consultation we have a lot of frank but we don't let loving enter the room equally <laughs> so second type of negative conflict um, is passive aggressiveness. And this is essentially when we express our anger indirectly rather than head on. Um, <laughs> so maybe, um, I'm really bad at thinking of examples on the spot, but maybe, you know, you cook dinner for your partner and they're like, oh, it was, it was really good. It just needed a little bit more salt. And so the next time you cook dinner, you pour like a pound of salt into it. And you're like, how was that? Was that enough salt? <laughs> so passive aggressiveness is really, um, you know, when something is, is irritating you, frustrating you, and you don't address it directly, but instead you turn to sarcasm, nagging, nitpicking, or just completely stonewalling them and giving them the silent treatment completely. Um, so really any time that, um, that, that you aren't communicating how you feel, but you're punishing them still for how you feel, that's passive aggressiveness and profoundly unhealthy, not a good thing. Next we have scapegoating. Um, I mentioned this a second ago. Scapegoating is essentially where we, we may be struggling in life or even struggling in the relationship, but essentially all of the blame is dumped onto one person. Typically when we scapegoat, we're putting the blame on somebody who um, we, we see to not have equal standing with us within the relationship. Um, so 
the scapegoat is the person who takes the brunt of the uh, complaints um, without the person who's doing the blaming actually like uh, thinking more deeply about what really is going on. And then the last type of negative conflict that we have is gaslighting. This is a phrase that is, it's so overused that I almost took it out of this presentation because I mean, I, I put this together a long time ago before it became kind of pop psychology. Um, but it's actually a really legitimate concept. It's just not properly understood <laughs> by most people. So gaslighting, we tend to think of gaslighting and again, in pop psychology, we, we tend to use the phrase gaslighting as we, we use that anytime somebody doesn't agree with us or somebody has a different perspective. And that's definitely not gaslighting. That's just called being human. But gaslighting is what we do when we are, um, <laughs> when rather than taking accountability and responsibility for something that we've done, we, we try to make the other person think that they're crazy for believing what they do. Um, and it's, it's, purely an attempt to absolve responsibility and to diminish the other person's sense of reality. So it is not differing opinions that don't get along. It isn't somebody who doesn't agree with you. It's somebody who refuses to be accountable and makes you think that you were wrong for thinking what you thought. Um, something that, that I see fairly frequently among the college population that I work with and, and even outside of it, um, you know, dating is, is really complicated and confusing these days. And, uh, you know, you'll have two people talking for a long period of time and, and, uh, and it's clear that there's momentum building, there's, there's feelings intensifying and, you know, they're, they're clearly not just friends and, uh, maybe they're undefined, but they aren't, platonic and it's mutually acknowledged uh, and then one person might just disappear uh, what 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 the kids are calling ghosting these days um, one person might just disappear they might just start dating somebody else they might even get engaged to somebody else out of the blue uh, and and then when the the first person that they were talking to was like what just happened where did you go I thought we had something good and the first person's like oh sorry, I didn't think that you felt that way. Like, wow, you really, you really had a different understanding of what was going on between us. And you're like, we were talking for eight hours a day. What are you talking about? And so that, that would be an example of gaslighting is like, no, it wasn't, wasn't me. And I, I'm not going to acknowledge the fact that I led you on for six months. Um, you had the, you had it wrong. So that would be an example of gaslighting. Do we have any questions? Just, I, I do want to just pop in and check in on that. Should I just keep barreling through or? How are uh, we I don't see any questions right now, um, but you know, if people want to drop in any questions at this point, they can. Okay. Yeah. I feel like I'm just like machine gunning all this information at you and feel free to, to stop me at any point. Um, okay. John Gottman uh, is a couples therapist who is like really worldly renowned as being the foremost researcher on couples dynamics. Um, and I'm giving this introduction because I'm trying to really drive home uh, how powerful this next bit of information can be. Uh, he's been researching couples for decades and uh, his research goes beyond just like casual interviews or surveys, but he, he, he will even like observe people living together and interacting over a long period of time and, and, and has like monitors hooked up to them to gauge heart rate and anxiety and stress levels. And, and it, it goes quite far. Like it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's the most detailed research of interpersonal and, and romantic interaction I've ever seen. And his work is so, <clears throat> so respected that actually when I was getting my PhD, when I was writing my dissertation, my committee members uh, told me that they simply will not 
pass me, they will not give me my doctorate unless I included his research and, and what I did. Like he's just that like level of, of incredible. Um, so John Gottman in his years of, of decades of work has realized that there are five, he calls them the horsemen of the apocalypse. You guys might've heard this outside of biblical terms. You might've heard of this like in, in psychology. Um, five horsemen who, when they are present in conflict, 90% of the time will be a predictor of divorce. 90%. Those are extremely high odds. And to be clear, these five, um, they will pop up every now and then when, you know, every couple will have an argument here or there where they, they weren't at their best. They aren't proud of how they handled it. It was ugly. But what matters is that that is the exception rather than the rule. So when when these five horsemen are present consistently during conflict, um, you're really headed for difficulty um, if you're not already there. So the first one that he talks about is contempt, uh, which is eye rolling, uh, or it's not, contempt is not synonymous with eye rolling, but contempt is often uh, most commonly expressed through eye rolling or scoffing. You know, somebody says something and you're just like, Ugh. Um, so contempt is any kind of expression that communicates to your partner that what they have to say just doesn't matter that much, um, that they're inferior, undesirable, not as smart as you, that you've heard this before. Ugh, why? Like, I, I really, I don't, I don't care about what you have to say. So it's, it's the smallest form of disrespect. And typically these five interactions, these five horsemen tend to happen sequentially. So contempt starts to show up the most often before it escalates into the next thing. So if you start to notice you responding, the two of you responding to each other, or one of you responding to the other more frequently with more common eye rolls or like, ugh, or body language that shows, you know, like, are we here again? Like, uh, I don't, I don't want to be here. I don't want to have this conversation. That's the the first seed of a relationship um, not doing well. And again, this is when it's the norm rather than the exception. A second type of interaction is criticism. This is something that is often referred to in the Baha'i writings uh, as, as, and these are my words, but as, you know, being quite unacceptable and, and hurting of another person's heart. So criticism is when you make any kind of disapproving judgment or evaluation about your partner. We, we know what criticism is. I don't need to overdefine it. We've all felt it. We've all probably done it. Um, but you know, criticism essentially happens when we continue to just, uh, tell our partner that it's not good enough. What they're doing isn't good enough. Who they are isn't good enough. Uh, and um, chipping away at their sense of worth, self-worth in the relationship. Then the next thing that that spills over into is defensiveness. This I think is maybe, even though it's kind of sandwiched in the middle of all of them, I think defensiveness happens more often than we realize. And, um, and it's a complicated one because a lot of times it's coming from good intention. A lot of times we become defensive because we're eager to show the other person that we're not the bad guy. We're, we're wanting them to know, uh, I didn't mean it. It's not as bad as you say. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm not the bad guy and you're not seeing it in the right way. And so what ends up happening is that when the person is um, expressing their perspective and expressing their views, uh, they don't feel hurt because the first person is so um, attached to showing them that they're not as bad as you think that they are um, that you don't even hear the spirit of what is being said. 
Like you just, you don't hear the spirit of it. You're, you're refusing to understand it because you're pushing back and trying to change their perception so that they, they don't get more and more upset. Does this make sense? Um, and defensiveness is also a really tricky one because we often don't realize when we're doing it. Uh, it's really, really hard for us to acknowledge that we're in a defensive state of mind because we, we again, we think it's coming from a good place and we think it's fair. We think it's it's justified in offering our perspective and in, in like bringing more, uh, bringing your voice to the table. And so we think like, no, I'm not being unfair. I'm, I'm advocating for myself. Um, and really what's happening is again, you're refusing to hear the spirit of what is being said. Um, and you know, one of the things that's mentioned in the Baha'i writings is that in order to have effective conversation and consultation is that it must be dispassionate. It has to be kind of removed from ego, removed from self and uh, objective. And defensiveness is the barrier to objectivity. Um, so it's very hard to tune into when you're being defensive. And I will give you a little bit of a key for you to understand um, or to, to for you to be able to kind of tune in to when you're being defensive. Um, if you are listening to your partner's grievance, if they are sharing with you something that is upsetting them and you find yourself kind of creating counterpoints and counter arguments and looking for holes in what they say as they're talking, you are in a defensive state of mind period. So if they are, uh, you know, telling you their grievances and, um, and you're like, nope, but I took the trash out last week. Nope. That's not true. I answered the phone this time. Nope. I, I wasn't late that other night. Like no, but, 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 and you're just looking for these holes in what they say you're in a defensive headspace and you're not actually listening to them. Next, we have stonewalling. Stonewalling is another one that is, is pretty, pretty clear cut. Stonewalling is essentially when you refuse to listen to your partner and, uh, or, or whoever you're clashing with in that moment. Um, and you kind of just act like they don't exist. So stonewalling is, you know, anything from refusing to answer texts to refusing to pick up the phone to refusing to answer their question when they're talking to you, refusing to acknowledge that they're even in the room with you when they're trying to get your attention um, and just completely icing them out. I wanna be clear that it's natural and common for people to need space to, to, to think, to clear their mind, to understand how they're feeling, um, and to not be ready to talk immediately. But that's not the same as punishing someone. Stonewalling is a form of punishment. You did this and now I'm not gonna answer your call. I'm not gonna answer your text. If they upset you and you're not ready to interact, then it's actually your responsibility to inform them of that and to let them know when you will be ready to have the conversation. Then you can take all the space you need as long as it's not coming from the place of of punishment and passive aggressive behavior because stonewalling is very passive aggressive. Uh, and then the last one we have is belligerence. Uh, belligerence is essentially going to war with your partner or with your friend, whoever you're arguing with. You're no longer in a state of being constructive, but you're actually just like, you're in it to win it. You're in it to, to show them that like, you don't even really care about truth anymore. You care about winning and you care about um, putting them in their place. Uh, and, and this can escalate into even like throwing food or screaming or, you know, breaking things like belligerence is, uh, it, it can get pretty ugly. Um, 
how are we doing? I think I see a few questions or comments popping up. I haven't read them, but I'm just Yeah, there's <clears throat> there's a few. First of all, thank you for that. Um, there's a few like, so there's some about the last slide. Um, so one is what's a good way to deal with passive aggressiveness? This this slide up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's a really good question. How do we deal with it? <sighs> well, the best way to deal with it is to first of all, you deal with it when you're feeling in a clear headspace, when you're feeling constructive, not when you're feeling reactive. So you want to make sure you're in a place of, of responding rather than reacting. So if, if you're angry about it, it's not the time. Um, and I, I think really the best thing to do is to ask them clearly, like, what is this about? Is, is something else bothering you? This feels unlike you. It seems like there's something else going on. Let's talk about it. Um, and, and wait, wait for them to be ready. Um, but also if this is, if this is their go-to tactic in relationships, then, and, and you haven't uh, committed in some kind of like serious way in terms of if it's a romantic relationship and, and, you're deciding if this is somebody that you want to be with, then you have to decide if some if this is something that you want to sign up for for the rest of your life. Um, but if if it's someone that you're already with and this is a major factor of your relationship, that's well, that's what therapy is for. <laughs> so you can have this conversation. Um, but also, it's important for us to take ownership of our role in this too, and ask them: Is there something about me that that makes you feel like you can't be transparent that you can't share what's upsetting you can I be doing something differently for you to know that it's safe for us to talk about this how can I how can I make it so that you know that this is a safe space for us to have hard conversations what do I need to do so we always have to look inward and think about like could I be doing something differently to help the situation be a better situation There's also an app question asking how to deal with ga gaslighting. So I guess like you'd <laughs> give the same answer to that. Yeah. Um, gaslighting. Yeah. Gaslighting is a hard one. Uh, if somebody gaslighting tends to be a tell that somebody is not taking responsibility. And if, if they never take responsibility, if they never take ownership, um, you've got a really long road ahead of you because that's, for those of you who are single and looking to get married, find somebody who is not afraid of accountability. <laughs> and, and if you are married or with someone or related to someone, friends with someone who has a hard time with accountability, um, in non-heated moments, you can talk about this. You can potentially uh, see where it goes. And again, having these hard conversations require you to be humble and open, truly humble and open, not, not calm. <laughs> calm is not the same thing as being humble. Um, and go into it with an open mind to understand them better. And, and at the end of the day, people, the other person decides if they want to do better and be better or not. It's not your responsibility. Great. Thanks. I think the rest of the questions we can leave to the end. Okay. Good. Sounds good. All right. So now we'll talk about positive conflict. Positive conflict is actually really, really healthy conflict. And you know that it's positive when you feel closer together at the end of it than you did when you first started. With positive conflict, you feel like you understand one another better. A, con um, a fight isn't constantly like recurring and on repeat. I do want to add the caveat, by the way, that um, <laughs> the this the statistic when it comes to arguments between couples, specifically relationships, is that something like seventy percent. It's like sixty-five to seventy percent of conflict is going to be, or sixty-five to seventy percent of your problems are what they call unsolvable problems, meaning that they are just core differences between the two of you that that aren't necessarily going to change that you just need to learn to to live with and so um it's really important in the midst of all this 
to realize when we're like wanting to, someone to be a human being that they're not to be someone that they're not versus trying to to understand an issue better and maybe you, you maybe your goal is learning how to live with the unsolvability of it how to learn to live with the difference of it maybe one of you likes to handle conflict head on and you like to talk about it right away and then the other one needs like a day or two or five to process that's not something you can solve that's not something you're going to fix so you need to learn how you can live with this in your relationship in the most effective way so positive conflict uh brings people closer together it creates stronger understanding it builds up one another's self-esteem because both partners feel valued and seen and heard feeling seen is like the, the most critical point of one of the most critical elements of a happy relationships so um conflict will help clarify differences it helps small issues from becoming big ones it can improve relationships and the entire key to this is to approach an issue as a teammate as teammates rather than opponents um what we talked about before with these five interactions in these scenarios people tend to turn away from one another during conflict rather than, than turning towards one another during conflict and so the key is to actually recognize that your partner is next to you not opposing you one one thing that a lot of therapists will have their clients do is uh when they feel a fight coming on have them go and put on like matching jerseys or matching t-shirts or some kind of like physical reminder of like nope we're teammates we're in this together and you know it's kind of playful kind of fun but it also breaks the tension that's building so it's actually a good interrupter and kind of a little bit of a reset for you to come back a little with a little bit of a silver mind um so can somebody read this hey Mona, would you mind reading this quote sure they must then proceed with the utmost devotion courtesy dignity care and moderation to express their views they must in every matter search out the truth and not insist upon their own opinion for stubbornness and persistence in one's views will lead ultimately to discord and wrangling and the truth will remain hidden This is beautiful and perfect and so hard to do sometimes. <laughs> but this is, um, to me, this is Abdul Baha summing up perfectly how to approach these hard conversations. And I think inherent in this, the, uh, the assumption here is that you approach a hard conversation when, again, when you are in a good headspace for it learning how to have positive conflict often means learning when or tuning into when you're not receptive to, to hear differently, to understand differently. So proceeding with the utmost devotion, courtesy, dignity, care, and moderation. They must in every matter search out the truth and not insist upon their own opinion for stubbornness and persistence and one's views will lead to discord and wrangling the truth. And, and wrangling and the truth will remain hidden. So this is your go-to. <laughs> Every time you're approaching a hard conversation, these are the very ingredients that you need to, to bring to the table. Um, so this brings us into how to have healthy conflict and how to um, resolve conflict in a constructive sort of way. So there's six, six major skills that you have to have present in order to have healthy conflict. Um, and we're going to cover these really quick. The first one is what they call soften the startup. Something that, that Gottman, and this is also Gottman's research, something that Gottman has found in his work is that conversations typically end with the same energy that they started on. So if you start out heated and angry, it's really, really difficult and rare for the conversation to end on a peaceful note. But if you start out truly constructive, calm, uh, having courtesy, dignity, moderation, 
if if you start with these being present in the conversation, uh, it typically will end with that same type of energy. So don't start a conversation that you're not ready to have. Um, and by the way, I I I'm gonna mention one of my like biggest pet peeves that I hear at literally like every bridal shower and bachelorette party that I ever go to is the advice of never go to bed angry. I hate this advice. I think it's so unhealthy. And I think sometimes the best thing that you can do is go to bed when you're angry. Sometimes you just need to put yourself to bed <laughs> and wake up with a clear mind, a rested body and calm hormones. Uh, forcing a conversation at night before you go to sleep when you're both tired and worn down and not at your best is like truly one of the dumbest things you could do. I shouldn't say dumb. So no offense, but it's one of the least constructive things that you can do. Let yourself go to bed. And if, if it's a valid conversation, the, the grievance will still be there in the morning. So it's not going anywhere. Okay. Soften the startup. Uh, number two, the next skill is accepting influence. Um, research has found that the happiest couples are the couples who are willing to accept the influence of their partner. Like, oh, I didn't, I never thought about it that way. Or, oh, you make a good point, but I, 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 I didn't realize that that was another way of looking at it. Or, yeah, I like, I like your suggestion better than I've been doing it. So actively look for points of unity in what they're saying that you can acknowledge and uh and appreciate and the, the data has actually found that it, men have a harder time doing this than women do um so maybe it's a it's a little something to, to keep in mind um i think partly because traditionally over the years and you know the climate is very different today but it was such common belief that the woman should not question the man and that it's it's the man's way uh and this is obviously specifically speaking to heterosexual romantic relationships. Um, and that, you know, it, it's the man's way and, and the woman just needs to like acquiesce and go along with it. And I think there's like residual resistance to female influence still in today's conversations. So it's important to have, to just keep that in the back of your mind and notice if you're being resistant, whether you're male or female. Number three, and I promise I'm almost done, so I won't talk your ear off. At first I thought 45 minutes for talking is way too much, and now I realize I'm almost at time. So number three, making effective repairs. Um, learn what things will soothe your partner when you're in the middle of a hard conversation. Um, Often it's either some kind of physical affection, like just a hand on their shoulder or reaching for their hand or hugging them while they're crying. The other one that can work really beautifully is humor. But the thing about humor is that it can either work really beautifully or it can add fuel to the fire if you don't time it the right way. <laughs> so um, that, that's something that you've gotta, you've gotta keep in mind. And one thing that the research has found is that, um, it's the timing of these repairs that matter. It, you, you have to be tuned into when it's effective and when you need to just like, just be and just listen. Um, and it takes two people to, um, to for, for this to be successful. It's the person who's initiating the repair, but then it's also about the person who's receiving it, being willing to receive it. You know, if somebody goes for your hand and you're like, don't touch me, then, then you're part of the problem. Okay. Next step is de-escalate. Um, de-escalating is essentially when you um, reflect back to your partner what you understand for them to be saying and then offering a solution, which typically involves offering how you're going to do better or do differently. You know, it's not really gonna be helpful if you're like, well, how about you just don't feel that way anymore? That's not offering a solution. <laughs> so. Uh, summarize what you understand them to be saying and then offer a solution, offer your role in that solution and, and be constructive. Um, next one, which we've talked about a little bit is learning how to soothe yourself and your partner. 
if you have reached a point where you are not being, you're not feeling constructive and you're just purely feeling rage and anger, that is not the time for a conversation. If you, there's a concept called flooding, um, where for any of you, I, I feel like all of us will have experiences at one point in our, in our lives. It's the type of anger where I, I call it hulking out, where you feel just rage going through your 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 system your blood is boiling your your palms might start sweating you can hear your heart beating your head is ringing and you're just like you want to punch a hole in the wall or you want to scream or like you just feel yourself in a in a very heightened state of anger those are that's a it's a whole cocktail of hormones that's been released in your system that has actually made it impossible for you to think rationally. And that's one of the reasons why I call it hulking out for any of you guys who are fans of Marvel and the Hulk. Once the Hulk turns green, you can't be rational with him. He just wants to smash. And so when an individual is flooding, they can no longer be rational. They just want to like emotionally smash. <laughs> um, and so it's very key to be able to tune into when that is happening and take a break. Healthy conversations, healthy conflict involve people being able to call a timeout um, so that they can learn to regulate their emotions. Um, and then number six is compromise. And we all know what this is. We've, we've talked about this already. Uh, negotiating and navigating ways to accommodate one another, um, not holding on to what you want too much. Again, this goes back to the concept of being dispassionate um and and allowing yourself to be influenced by what they have to say and, and changing things accordingly um last quote okay Mona, do you mind reading this and then we'll finish up sure <clears throat> the sign of the intellect is contemplation and the sign of contemplation is silence because it, it is impossible for a man to do two things at one time he cannot both speak and meditate I included this because I love it so much. The sign of the intellect is contemplation and the sign of contemplation is silence. You, you cannot be truly striving to understand your partner if you're busy defending your position all the time. So again, going back to, to our role in all of this, our role is to, to contemplate about what they're offering as their grievance to contemplate about who we are and how we can be showing up as a better version of ourselves, to contemplate about where you want the future of the relationship to go and how you're gonna to contribute to it. And you cannot do that if you're in an activated state of fighting back, arguing, um, and trying to win the, the fight. So I'd, yeah, I just wanted to close with that and open it up to questions and thoughts and thank you guys for listening to me i hope you're still awake <laughs> oh thanks so much that was really interesting <clears throat> um yeah we already have some questions and yeah people can put their questions in the chat um so one question is how do you deal with laziness and selfishness which seems akin to a lack of responsibility well that's a hard one uh, <laughs> you're, you're just going in with all the hard ones um how do you deal with laziness and selfishness? Is that, is that the other piece of it? Yeah. You know, something that I have found in my work is that there's, there's always something a little bit, this is a really, really big question that I, I'm, I don't know that I can distill it into a, a simple answer. Um, number one, the answer for all of your questions is probably going to be therapy. So I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> so let's just understand that that's helpful. Also, I would love to see your faces. If any of you feel like turning your cameras on it, it would make me happy, but no pressure. I also understand, you know, not wanting to be on camera. Um, I, I think it would be helpful to be curious about, um, the why behind the laziness and even the selfishness. 
Um, often if people grew up in some kind of survival mode, if they grew up in a household where, um, where the type of parenting that they experienced created a certain reaction in them, it can sometimes manifest as selfishness. Um, if you had to raise yourself, you know, if you had absent parents and, and you just had to only take care of yourself, then you're in survival mode and then you've never left that. Um, laziness can actually sometimes ironically be connected to perfectionism. Um, sometimes if we, if we want something to be done perfectly and the idea of that is overwhelming to us, it can cause us to just not take action at all. Um, so, or it could be connected to depression. It could be connected to grief. It could be connected, could be connected to a lot of things. And that's why I see, I say that therapy would help. It's so that you can kind of get to the root of the why and, and start to heal it from there. And also sometimes our definition of, of lazy and selfishness is different. What, what is lazy to one person could be self-care to another person. So it's also important to, to understand how are we defining these things and, uh, and do we have the same definition of it? Do we have the same definition of selfishness? Maybe, maybe you're eager. Is eagerness the same thing as selfishness? Eh, maybe, maybe not. So it, it merits a deeper conversation. Um, when you were talking about repair and you said like one method is jokes. So the question is, can we use any types of jokes? Not sarcasm. <laughs> um really you've gotta you've gotta it's about your partner and what works for them that that's really what it comes down to somebody might love physical humor and somebody else might think it's lame so you've you've got to know what works for your partner and that's it's about speaking their language and, and cracking jokes that they'll respond to but never it should never be at the expense of their respect like oh, you're crying about this again. Like, that's not a joke. That's mocking. <laughs> yeah. Um, can couples with different personalities find common ground? Absolutely. Absolutely. Some, you know, not, not all dynamics are created equally smooth. Um, but you decide if you guys have common ground, you know, the, the amount of common ground between you is varies based on the couple. You could be very different people, but your, uh, you know, your spirituality could be compatible. Your views about, you know, uh, global change could be compatible. Your views about raising children, like it, yeah, you can always, I think you can find common ground with anybody. And I think that this is one of the most uh, common misconceptions today is like, we take one aspect of how we're different and we make it everything. You voted for this person or you believe this one thing or like you don't believe this other thing. Therefore, like we could never be the same. But in reality, two people who at first glance are like polar opposites, maybe had very similar childhoods. Maybe they were both bullied. Maybe they both grew up in, in homes with an absent mother or an absent father. Maybe they both are, you know, they, they both understand what it's like to, to struggle, to hurt. You know, our, our commonness is much stronger than our difference. I would say across the board. It's just that the differences are louder. We make them louder. Um, how does one deal with emotional, financial, or physical abuse in a relationship? Those are very different things. Physical abuse is unacceptable. And uh, I would say, depending on the context, that you should not deal with it. Um, emotional abuse, again, depends on context. Uh, and it depends on the other person's willingness to change. Um, I'm not totally sure what financial abuse is unless it's like, you know, restricting your access to funds or, or driving you into debt, you know, by being irresponsible with money. Um, but the, the 
first and foremost, if the abusive party wants to change and is actively working towards change, then this is something that I believe can only be healed through therapy. Um, but if they have no investment in changing and you are expected to put up with it, I would leave when it comes to physical and emotional abuse, especially if there are children involved. Um, but that's a, that's a very loaded question that uh, I couldn't answer in just two seconds without knowing a lot more about it. Um, yeah, it's definitely complicated. Depends yeah. on what the situation is. Yeah. yeah. Um, the next question is also pretty loaded, but it's when should we consider divorce instead of healing the relationship? Um, after you can both say that you have given a hundred percent to healing the relationship and you can say that you can each say that you have shown up as the absolute best version of yourself and things still have not changed. So, you know, divorce, we tend to go to divorce a bit too quickly. Um, and I think, uh, you know, a lot of marriages could be saved that, that, that people don't necessarily try to save. So I would say, if you can say with a with absolute clear conscience, you can, you know, full confidence that I gave a hundred percent and I showed up as the absolute best version of myself, and so did my partner, then I would say the last resort is divorce. If if it is actively chipping away at your sense of self uh, self worth and well being. You know, um, it also depends on the reasons as to why you're considering divorce. Are you bored or are you uh, unwell? <laughs> you know, so there, there's there's a lot to it. Are you just looking for something better and it's just not exciting anymore? Or are you actively feeling your soul like deteriorate in this relationship? Is it pulling you further away from God? Maybe that's an easier way to put it. Um, if the relationship is actually hindering your relationship with God, assuming a relationship with a higher power. But again, huge question, need a therapist. <laughs> um, next question is if, you know, you'd be, you know, willing to write like a book about like relationships and the Baha'i writing, something like that. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I, yeah, I would be willing. I feel like there's a lot of books out there with the Baha'i writings and relationships. Um, I think it would depend on if there's a specific need, like a specific gap that could be filled. I would be open to it. I, I do have plans to write books in the future and I, I would love to offer something to the Baha'i community if, if it felt like there was anything helpful there. I actually have... Um, I'm very passionate about talking to Baha'i youth. Actually, I, um, it doesn't even have to be Baha'i, just like young people growing up with religious standards. I actually am like very closely involved with the LDS community here. And I've gone and given talks to their youth about healthy dating with um, uh, religious principle and, and, and standards. So if, if I was to write a book about anything, it might be about effective courtship um before marriage because i think i think we could use a little input there yeah i think that's actually a good idea like you know people who are trying to adhere to certain like spiritual or religious standards i feel like there's not much about that so yeah yeah, yeah. if any of you want me to come out to your communities and talk to your youth i will happily do it because i'm very passionate about that <laughs> Um, are there any books you could recommend for people to read on conflict and healing? Um, yeah, there, any of John Gottman's books are very, very easy to read, easy to digest. Um, you can just, I think his website is just gottman.com. Uh, Esther Perel also has some really good books. Uh, it kind of depends on the, on the detail of what you're looking for help with. Um, 
but I, I love Gottman's work. I, I clearly, I mean, my whole talk was based on it. Um, his books are, are really, really easy to understand and well-written. So I would pick any of those. Esther Perel has a couple books about like love and intimacy and infidelity and uh, kind of understanding that too. So, yeah. Great. Um, the next question is, what to you are the most important things to investigate before marrying someone and why? Uh, <laughs> I, I will try to keep this simple because I can really go off on this topic. Um, I fundamentally think that we don't know how to date these days. I think we're stuck in this like culture of like dinner and a movie which is very um, useless, frankly, because a, a, having dinner together is just kind of a bit of a glorified interview. If you're attracted to them and you want to date them, you know, you're not really fully your, 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 all of you. Um, not that you're trying to actively lie, but you're not showing all of you. You're not talking about your insecurities, your anxieties, your pains, potential traumas, um, quirks. We just don't talk about that. We're, we're a lot more like, I love hiking and I love yoga and I drink a kale smoothie every day and I have a great relationship with my parents. Like we present ourselves in a really, really polished way and then keep up that veneer as long as we can, um, often to the point of no return when when attachment happens and, and you, you don't know how to like undo the attachment that's been created. <coughs> so the best piece of advice that I can offer is to see who they are when they're very stressed out, see who they are at their worst, and then decide if that's someone that you can live with for the rest of your life and do that as early in the process, as early in the process as you can. I realize like maybe the first date, you just want to see if you can even engage in conversation with them. But after that, I would, <clears throat> quickly go out of interview mode and into action mode so you know do something that neither one of you is going to be good at on the first try like making pottery nobody is perfect at making pottery on the first try or ice skating nobody's perfect at ice skating on the first try unless you're like you know a professional like rollerblader or something not professional but anyway do something where neither one of you can show up as your most polished self. And if there's an added element of stress, sprinkle that in there and see if you like who they are. Do they encourage you? Do they encourage themselves? Are they kind? Do they get angry? Do they, um, do they make fun of you? I had a friend who went ice skating with a guy and she said that she kept falling and the guy, all he did was video her on the phone because he thought it was so funny. Like that tells you a lot about this person, you know? Um, and so uh, I actually, I was talking about this with one of my students in, a few years ago and she said that um, uh, she, she worked for a company where in their interview process during the last interview, uh, when they're deciding if they're gonna hire somebody or not, they take them to a fancy lunch with a bunch of executives. And, uh, and what the person doesn't know is that they've arranged with the server to spill food in their lap. And it's something harmless, like a bread basket or like salad with no dressing or whatever. Obviously it's not like soup. Um, food is spilled on their lap and then they watch you to see how you respond. Do you scream and be like, watch what you're doing? You know, I want to see a manager. I expect my food to be free. I can't believe you would do that. Like, how can you be so clumsy? Or are they like, you know what? We all have bad days. No harm, no foul, no big deal. Let me help you pick this up. Um, how they react in that split second of dropping that veneer tells you so much about who they are. So get into situations where you can see see behind that mask not talk about it because it, talking does nothing you've got to see it and then and so between that and then in the long run if you've been together for a while if you're deciding if you want to marry them or not 
the one piece of advice that I have is if you would be happy having children who were exactly like them, then that's who you marry. Whether you want children or not, you understand the spirit of the, of the concept. If you would be happy having children exactly like your partner, then that's who you keep. And if the thought of having children exactly like them terrifies you, then, then you might want to rethink your choice. Thanks. I said I was going to talk a lot, but I did. I'm sorry. No, that's great. I was just processing <laughs> what you were saying. Yeah, that's... Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's a question of like, how can you find a good therapist? Um, I'll give you my email. I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, the thing is, you, you, you won't really know if they're good uh, until you talk to them for a little bit. Um, the biggest predictor of effective therapy is how much you click with them. It's not how many degrees they have, where they went to school, how long they've been practicing. The single biggest predictor is the click between the two of you. So most therapists offer some kind of complimentary consult before you decide to work together, just to see if you're compatible working together. And that's, you know, then you kind of, you feel it out from there. It, if they went to Harvard and have three doctorates um, and have been doing this for 50 years, but you, you don't feel like you can open up to them or you don't agree with anything that they say, they're not the one for you. So you might just have to try a few out before you find one that you like, or you could hit the bullseye on the first try. Um, personal recommendation can, can help a lot. Ask somebody who has gone through a hard time and who's better for it now uh, who went to therapy and asked them, you know, for their information. Personal recommendation is probably the best way to go. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you again so much for this. This was really interesting. And I'm sure we'll all go back and like re-listen to this when we. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It was nice to be here today. And <laughs> it's cute. I didn't know that they could move. Um, <laughs> Yeah, thank you guys. This is really lovely. I, I wish I wish I could have talked more with all of you, but um, I really appreciate you having me today. It's a great way to start my weekend. Yeah, it's great for us too. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so our speaker next week will be Dr. Sipide Tahiri, and the topic will be summons of the Lord of Hosts, an exploration of Baha'u'llah's messages to the kings and rulers and their implications for today. So again, these talks are every Saturday at noon Eastern time, and I'll put the link to our YouTube channel and our mailing list in the chat. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Bye.